Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness, Father. Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, Father, that we would hear what you want to say to each one of us very personally, Father, and that, Lord, give us the, the, the faith and the obedience to really carry those things out, Lord. Amen. Well, this morning I want to speak about understanding faith, and this is part one, and it's called creative faith. The Greek word, little faith, olgeo pistos, is used five times in the New Testament, and four of those occurrences are found in the Gospel of Matthew. The other one is in the Gospel of Luke. In each occurrence, Christ showed his disciples areas where their faith still lacked the depth and maturity necessary to withstand the rigors, challenges, and trials of life. Our faith may be strong in specific areas, but Jesus wants our faith to grow and mature in every area of our lives. You know, many, I've heard this quote before that they say the Western church is a mile wide and an inch deep. And so God wants to go deeper in our faith, in our confidence in the Lord. Each time Jesus confronted them with their weak faith, he included the rebuke, O you of little faith. Jesus' motivation for pointing out their little faith was not to humiliate or discourage them, but to help them recognize aspects of their faith that were weak. He wanted them to develop an unshakable faith enabling them to stand strong in the face of whatever trials, hardships, or uncertainties of life that life would throw at them. Jesus was preparing his apostles to establish the church on such a firm foundation that even the gates of hell could not prevail. Jesus' disciples became so strong and unshakable in their faith that even in the face of persecution, it was their persecutors who became unhinged. In Acts 17, 6, it is recorded that the Jews lamented to the Roman rulers about the power, persuasiveness, and how unstoppable the gospel message was by describing the followers of Jesus. Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Can you imagine that the Jews are going to the Roman rulers of the city and say, those people who have turned the whole world upside down, they're now here. Do something about it. Stop them. In the face of persecution, the church was not deterred or even shaken, but it was the persecutors that were shaken. However, before the church and the apostles could be established in the grace of God, their unshakable confidence in Jesus Christ had to be established, and the littleness of their faith had to be overcome. The Greek word, olgeopistos, little faith, if I'm not pronouncing it right, don't, don't worry about it, I'm Jewish, um, comes from two root words, little, olgios, and faith, pistos. The Greek word little, olgios, conveys the idea of something that is small or weak. The word olgios is used to emphasize the smallness of something. The Greek word faith, pistos, speaks of a strong and unshakable confidence in someone or something. Thus, olgeopistos, little faith, may be seen as an oxymoron or as a contradictory term because faith, which is meant to make someone strong, confident, and unshakable, is actually so weak and small that it results in people who are insecure, hesitant, unstable, and easily shaken. Little faith actually conveys the idea of, a la of lacking faith and confidence in God. So when he said little faith, he wasn't saying your faith is small. He was saying you're lacking faith. An example of little olgios being used in combination with another word in conveying weakness is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. The Greek word faint-hearted is olgeo sukos, and it's made, but made up of two Greek words, olgeos, small, and sukos, soul. And thus, a small or weak-souled person, it defines a person who is very weak and easily discouraged, timid, and collapses at the least hardship or adversity. 
So they said faint-hearted really means little-souled. In the same way, little faith, orgiopistos, means a faith that is small, weak, and easily collapses at the least opposition or difficulty. And I think we've all experienced this, right? Where we've been confronted by things, and our whole demeanor, our whole essence is shaken. In contrast to Jesus' warning against having little faith, he spoke about faith as a mustard seed in a very positive sense. So when he talked about faith as a mustard seed, he was saying something good versus saying little faith, something negative. Matthew 17, 20. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. After Jesus rebuked the disciples for their unbelief, He encouraged them by saying that even if their faith was as small as a mustard seed, it could move mountains. Mark 4, 31 and 32. It is like a mustard seed, which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. When Jesus compared true faith to a mustard seed, he was emphasizing the vitality in life it contained. In other words, true faith, even when it's small, is alive, is vibrant, and it can do great things. When you first come to Christ, you already can pray for the sick. You can already share the gospel. Because even though it's mustard seed faith, it's alive and vibrant. Even young believer who may consider himself as having only mustard seed faith, is capable of doing great exploits through his faith in Christ. Faith as a mustard seed shows how true faith, even when it's small and young, is vibrant and when acted upon will grow strong to become so great that it may take, that many may take shelter in it. When a Christian has unshakable confidence in Jesus during difficult or troubled times, Both unbelievers and believers will be drawn to that person to find peace, hope, and comfort. You know, it's interesting that in countries where things are very difficult, where there's turmoil, where there's there's, uh, violence, where there's political and social unheaval, when there's all these things, you know what happens? In those churches, uh, in those countries, those churches grow quickly. Many people come to Christ to go, why is that? Well, first of all, because people see their need. But you know what the second reason is? When they find believers who are not shaken, when everybody else is shaken, they want to come under the shade of their faith and say, why do you have hope? I'm shaken. And they're drawn to those people who have confidence even when the world around them is collapsing and non-believers will come and be shaded by their faith and through that find Christ. But for that to be a reality in our lives... We need to have that unshakable faith so when catastrophes will be around us, we will be confident and people will be drawn to that confidence and they will want to come close so they will not be shaken. And through that, they'll find Christ. Many times, Christians misunderstand the concept of faith in God and attempt mental or emotional gymnastics to cause them to believe more. Their attention is diverted from focusing on Jesus to focusing on themselves as they, as they vainly try to have more faith. You know, you ever seen that? You have a need, and so people say, well, if you can believe, you can get it. Okay, I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. Yeah, I believe, I believe God's gonna heal me. I, I believe this is gonna happen. Yes, I believe it. But you know, that's just emotional gymnastics. I go, did you forget one component? I go, what? It's Jesus. It's not like making us trying to believe more. And if we try to believe harder, then finally it'll happen. Faith, like a mustard seed, we look to Jesus and it grows. Faith means having a strong confidence in something or someone. As Christians, our faith is in Jesus Christ. And as we look to Jesus, we learn to live by faith. 
Galatians 2.20. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So how do we live? We live by believing in Jesus. We just start to learn to walk with the Lord. You have struggles. We have issues. We have difficult circumstances we're facing. Just look to Jesus and say, God, just teach me how to walk with you. We are not to have faith in faith, but faith in Jesus Christ and his faithfulness. We're not to have faith in faith, but faith in Jesus. One time, a, a friend of mine, actually, he's, uh, he's going to come and visit our church from Ukraine next month. Um, and I met him like 25 years ago when I was doing a mission trip there. And we, anyways, uh, wh- one time, you know, when people, he was a pastor, but when people come for prayer, you know, he'd pray for the people who have the, you know, the headaches, right? The coughs. But when somebody would come up who's paralyzed in a wheelchair or whatever, he would really be reluctant to pray for them. He'd go and gravitate to the headache people. Anyways, one day, as he was at home praying, the Lord, he felt the Lord ask him a question. He said, why are you reluctant to pray for the people who have serious illnesses? And he thought for a moment. He says, well, in case nothing happens. And the Lord says, so when you pray and they're healed, who healed them? He says, well, you did, Lord. So what are you worried about? You pray and I'll deal with the results. Actually, can I share one second thing what you shared with me? Is that okay? Uh, you know, Jerry, I like Jerry because Jerry likes me. But anyways, <laughs> well, Jerry's had a medical condition where his growth hormone was, it normal is two, his was zero. Zero. He had no energy, nothing. So we and many of us came in, and every time I'd see him, I'd hold, ha, pray for him, and others were praying for him. So we went back to the doctors for more blood work. They did extensive blood work. They said his blood work is totally normal now, totally normal, including the growth hormone. Isn't that amazing? But what do we do? Every time I saw him, we'd pray, and we, others would pray, and we just prayed for months and months and months, right? We didn't say we didn't see something. We said, well, our job is to pray, and God's job is to heal. I like that. The term little faith points to a faith that is the opposite of a growing and vibrant faith. Little faith is defective and weak since it has a wrong or limited image of God that hinders the person from trusting Jesus and having confidence in God. In other words, when you have little faith, lack of faith, it's because your image of God is either defective or limited. In fact, the term little faith points to a lack of faith, while mustard seed faith speaks about a genuine faith and confidence in Christ. You know, so when we're going through a difficult time and we feel shaken, when we feel like we're worried, we're overwhelmed, we're fearful, we're confused, now there's two things you can do. You can do the wrong thing, which is withdraw and drown in fear and doubt and confusion. Or... You can do something different. You can then, what I do when I feel that pressure on me, when I feel that heaviness, when I feel all, I take the Bible and I begin to read the Bible. I study the Bible. But I'm not studying it because, well, I better read the Bible so I'm nervous so I better read the Bible. No, I read it because I realize that I'm having a limited or wrong image of God at that moment. Right? I've forgotten about something about his faithfulness or goodness. So I begin to read those parts of scripture that will give me a proper image again, restoring, oh yeah, that's right. So when I read the Bible, oh yeah, yeah, you're faithful. Oh yes, you do this. That's one thing I do. So I spend time reading and thinking about God and getting the proper image. Number two is I phone people and I say, you know, I'm feeling down right now. Can we just talk about God? So they'll start sharing things that God has done in their life. Maybe they've shared it before, but talking about maybe how God healed someone or the things that God has done in their life. And then I start to share what God has done in my life. And we just spend time talking about the goodness of God. And we go, yeah, I remember when we prayed and that God did that miracle. Or I remember when we prayed and God answered that in such a supernatural way. And as, I'm, as we're doing this, all of a sudden, oh yeah, I can trust you. It doesn't mean the problems have gone away. 
but it means that my image of God has been restored and it's widened again. And the third thing is prayer. You know, when we pray, we just turn to God in prayer and we just share what we're struggling with. You say, God, I'm really struggling, but I trust you. Lord, I put this situation before you, but I thank you that you're hearing me. I thank you that you're moving. I thank you, Lord, that you're leading even when I can't yet see it. You know, so when we phone someone up and you're feeling down, don't say, I feel so lousy. You wouldn't believe all the things that have happened. That's not encouragement for you or them. In fact, it's like saying, I'm sinking, so I'm going to tie an anchor around you too so we'll sink together. It's about us to remember God's faithfulness. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but the, but the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. And not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. True faith is not only faith in Jesus Christ, but it is faith that comes from Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might have be justified by the faith of Christ. Twice in this verse, faith is described as Christ's faith. Because we have received faith from God, we're able to believe in Jesus Christ. In other words, it says it's the faith of Christ. It's not our faith, it's Christ's faith given to us. Genuine faith comes from God, but we must choose to receive it and act upon it. You know, when you, 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 know, when you witness to somebody, there are two basic aspects. Sometimes you witness somebody, and they look at you and say, oh, that's nice. What that really means is the lights are on, but nobody's home. There is no response. But there's other times that when you're speaking, you can see that something is happening within them. What is actually happening is the Holy Spirit is touching them so they can believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is speaking to them and they're sensing that faith, but they still need to choose to receive that faith and repent and receive Christ. But at that moment, that faith isn't something that you're conjuring up or something they are. They're just listening and as you're speaking, the Holy Spirit is touching them with faith and they're starting to see that this, belie- this, is, I, this is believable. This seems right, but they still need to choose to receive that faith and act on that faith to be saved. It is very important to understand that although the origin of our faith is from God and is not something we can produce, we must act daily on that faith for it to grow and develop. In other words, every day we need to say, God, I'm learning to trust you more. Every day I'm going to trust you even when things are difficult. And Lord, I'm going to look to you. And as we do, just like a mustard seed, it keeps growing more and more and more. The way our faith grows is by simply directing our full attention to Jesus and all he has done for us at Calvary and all he has promised to do for us through his word. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not like, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. We look to Jesus without recognizing faith is growing, isn't it? When you get together and we're worshiping God, reading the word, we're fellowshipping, we're praying for one another, Faith is growing without us saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. Because true faith is from Christ, and it's in Christ. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now the Greek word looking unto is actually a very unique word. In the Greek it actually means to look away from something and to look to something else. When, so when, when it says in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, say, take your eyes off whatever else you're looking at and turn your eyes and look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. 
So looking unto means repentance, turning away from what is destructive or tearing our faith down or causing us to be fearful or discouraged and turning and looking unto Jesus, which is our act of faith by saying, I'm looking at you now. I'm not going to look at those things that are causing me fear or doubt or disappointment or discouragement. Mustard seed faith enables us to learn to take the heavy burdens of life and give them over to Jesus, while little faith magnifies our problems and causes our image of God to grow smaller. Isn't that true? So mustard seed faith is a faith that is looking to Jesus with, yes, yes, God, I don't have the answers to all these things, but I'm not going to look at all these issues. I'm going to look to you, and you're going to lead me to have wisdom of how to deal with each issue, each situation. But little faith, which is a lack of faith, causes us to look at our problems, and even problems that may appear initially fairly small become huge. You know, if you have those who have children... You know that a child can take one little disappointing thing, and if they focus on it, they can become hysterical, which then causes the parents to become hysterical. But anyways, but you just, isn't that true? A child can look at one small thing that is not a big deal, but get, why can't I have it? Why can't you know? What I mean, and before you know it, the whole thing is just blowing up. And it, when we're focusing on those negative things, that tears your faith down, and even small things looks like everything's coming to an end. Four times, from the four times that Jesus says, oh, you have little faith in the gospel of Matthew, we can identify four things that attack our faith and God's strategy to overcome them. And there are four aspects of faith, and each one releases God's glory. There's creative faith. This is the power of faith, and it brings the glory of his name. The second aspect is doctrinal faith. This is the truth of faith, and this is the glory of his word. There's persevering faith, and this is the strength of faith, and it's the glory of his life. And then there's God-conscious faith. This is the reality of faith, and it's the glory of his presence. But we're only going to look at the first one today. The first time Jesus rebukes the disciples with the words, O ye of little faith, is found in Matthew 6, verse 30. And if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? This rebuke relates to creative faith and warns against those things that oppose receiving God's provision and resist God working miraculously in our lives. Through creative faith, God's provision is released in our lives, whether through miracles, healings, or his divine supply for those areas where we are lacking, experiencing lack. In other words, one example of creative faith is when Jesus fed the 5,000 by multiplying the five loaves and the two fish. Right? That's creative faith. There was a lack. There were only five loaves and two fish. But there were 5,000 men plus women and children on top of that that needed to be fed. But creative faith is where we see God taking and multiplying and providing. But also, when we pray for someone and they're healed, there's creative faith. But there's also another aspect of creative faith. It's where we have a need, and God answers that need supernaturally. And so that sometimes we sometimes neglect to notice that as much. But it's important. Sometimes you're saying, God, I need a breakthrough in this area. And all of a sudden, out out of nothing comes the answer. I mean, many of you know the story about how we found this building, and and basically, we prayed for five months, six months for a building. That, Lord, we need a place to meet. This is like 2000. It was actually 1999 at the time. And, and, and anyways, through it, people had different visions within those five months of, of a building. We didn't know. We didn't know where the building is, if that was even correct, those visions. We just didn't know. But I remember... Three days, and I gave the Lord the date. I said, if you could show us that building by March 1st, 2000. The reason I chose March 1st was that's the date when the shepherd's God changes the ad. You can change your address as a church. That's a cutoff date. So I'm, I'm very practical. And I remember about a week before March 1st, 
I said, Lord, it's getting close to March 1st. I just wanted to remind him. And I said to him, and if you could show us that building by March 1st, I'd really appreciate that. Anyways, but three days later, somebody said, hey, there's this church building for sale. Oh, we're not looking at buying a church building. We're looking at renting something. You know, I just wanted a small little kind of building, maybe a few, you know, 500 square feet where we could just meet. And now all of a sudden somebody says, bitch, oh, yeah, it's not. Anyways, we ended up going and seeing it. And then it happened to be an accord to the visions that people had before. One of those visions was 11 years before, and the other one was three weeks before. And you actually had a dream of the building what, two years before, or four years before. She actually had a dream, and she saw this building four years before. But the interesting thing was that the last vision was three weeks before we found it, but the building only went for sale three days before we found it. That's creative faith, where there was nothing. There was nothing. We were praying, God, there is no answer. And all of a sudden, God creates the answer. One of the first vision was 11 years before. But God saw our need 11 years in the future. Isn't that amazing? But creative faith. But you realize, well, God didn't create the building. Yes, but he created the circumstances where we pr he provided for the building. The very first time a believer experiences creative faith is when they repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ and are born again. At that moment, something wonderful took place. We became a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The moment you received Christ, creative faith was an operation in you, and you were born again. You became a new creation. Something that was never existing is now created. You in Christ. That's creative faith. So your very first experience with faith is creative faith. Matthew 6, starting at verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? It is evident when reading the context of the reproof, O you of little faith, that it contains a warning against worrying. Of the six times the Greek word for worry is used in the Gospel of Matthew, five of those occurrences are found in Matthew chapter 6 in relationship to O oh, you of little faith. So there's only six times the word worry is used in Matthew, and five of them is in the context of you of little faith. So you can start to see what is the enemy of creative faith. The Greek word for worry means to have anxiety, anxious thoughts, to have anxiety based on possible danger, misfortune, or the uncertainties of life. Worry distorts our view of what is really important. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The Greek word translated as life is the word soul. Is our soul not, worth, not more important than what we eat and wear? Worry causes our value system to become skewed. Worry blinds us to the value of eternal things and causes us to focus only on our immediate needs or troubles. Worry blinds us to God's faithfulness and provision. Isn't that true? Worry is more destructive than you may realize. In other words, we're so used to worrying, we think it's normal. But it's not normal. It's destructive. Worry is a result of sin. Sin produces worry. It causes us to be shaken. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your Father feeds, Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Worry distorts our image of God's character and causes us to doubt his faithfulness provision. Worry is the enemy of creative faith. Worry and faith cannot coexist. So worry distorts our image of God. We become blind to God's faithfulness, even though all creation testifies to God's provision, faithfulness, wisdom, and power. Isn't that true? When you worry, 
All of a sudden, you forget about everything God has already done for you. You forget about all what, is, what he's promised. It's like you're there saying, what's going to happen? We've forgotten totally about God's faithfulness. Worry causes us to not only doubt God, but to mistrust him. We don't trust that God is able or willing to meet our needs. We don't trust that he values or cares for us. We don't trust in his love. Verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? The New Re uh, Revised Standard Translation translates it this way. And can... And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your lifespan? Worry is the opposite of creative faith because worry does not and cannot produce anything. You worry and worry and worry, and I guarantee you, your worry will help you do nothing. Well, I'm going to keep worrying until I get this resolved. Worry steals and depletes our strength and faith. Creative faith produces life. Worry produces death. George Mueller, this is a, uh, a quote from him, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Corey Ten Boom, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, it empties today of its strength. And this is a quote, but I don't know where it's from. If you pray, why worry? And if you worry, why pray? Worry hinders us from receiving from God. Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus posed the question, so why do you worry? Jesus directs our attention to Solomon and all the glory riches and power he had as a king. However, Solomon in all his glory could not array himself as beautifully as a little insignificant flower in the field. You know, all the glory, if you look at a flower, it's just so amazing, the delicacy. You go, even Solomon in all his glory couldn't be dressed up as nice as that flower. And that little flower, as you look at it, a cow will come by and munch, it's gone. And he says, if God takes care of the little flowers they get munched on, how much more will he take care of you? Verse 30. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Will he not much more clothe you? God's provision is sufficient. If God cares so much for the temporal things, such as the grass of the field, will he not be even more attentive to us who have eternal value? So if God is considered, concerned even about the grass, how much more is he concerned for us? Oh, you of little faith, the smallness of our faith hinders us from trusting him and moving in creative faith and believing in God's provision. We can either have fear and doubt, capture our attention, or we can look to Jesus and have his love capture our attention. Because when you're looking at your problems, they have captured your attention. Verse 31, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whatever we, what shall we wear? Therefore do not worry. This is the conclusion Jesus is driving home to all his followers. When he said, oh ye little faith, he says, do not worry. Don't ask, where is God when I need him? But say, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So when we're in need, where we don't know how it's going to come together, we don't know where the breakthrough is going to be. Instead of saying, God, where are you in this? We say, my God shall supply all my needs. Verse 32, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. God knows your needs, and God will respond to your needs. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Sometimes we worry because our priorities are wrong and confuse needs with wants. 
when we first we put God first in our lives, we begin to have a more balanced view of our priorities and of our lives. Verse 34. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Therefore do not worry. Again, this instruction is emphasized. Therefore do not worry. If we continue to worry and fail to trust God, we will condemn ourselves to a life of worry because there will always be plenty of things to worry about. Do you realize that? If someone says, I don't know what to worry about, I don't know, I'm running out of things to worry about, just come over to me and I'll give you a lot of things you can worry about. You know, people who are worriers will get up in the morning if they have no problem at all, if they can't think of one thing to worry about, they're worried that there's something they don't know about. Right? It says, don't worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough trouble. But do not worry. If we continue to worry and fail to trust God, we will condemn ourselves to a life of worry because there will always be plenty of things to worry about. Instead, we must exercise our faith and choose to trust God for our needs today and for the uncertainties of tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. We do not know what tomorrow is going to hold, but God does. But we have to say, God, I'm going to trust you for my needs today. And I'm going to trust you for the uncertainties of tomorrow. That will free you from living a life of bondage to fear and worry. The context of the passages in Matthew chapter 6 that we've just studied deal with being free from worry and resting our faith in God's provision. In Jesus' teaching we learn that we can trust God to provide for our needs, implying that we will face times where we'll have needs, experience lack, and face hardship. That's a reality. That is a reality. Creative faith can only grow and develop when we have opportunities to trust God and then witness His divine provision. In other words, if you want to be growing big muscles, you don't look at weights, you lift them. True? So when you're saying, oh, I'm trusting God. What, 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 any trouble in your life? No, everything is great, so I'm trusting God. No, that's not going to way it's going to work. Creative faith can only grow and develop when we have opportunities to trust God and then witness His divine provision. In other words, you have needs... You seek God, and then when he finally provides, you go, he's faithful again. Here's a, a, a story about George Mueller, and I think I've, I've mentioned him before, but those who don't know, in the, in the turn of the, uh, in the middle of the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, he, was, he came to England, he was a believer, and he noticed something. He saw the need of the orphans. Nobody took care of orphans. They left them on the street. They were like stray animals. And he was so stirred by God to begin to reach out to them and to clothe them, to house them, to train them, to, to give them love. And so he began this work, and he had no, no provision. He, had, he was a poor man. Years go by, he continues to seek God, and he never, did, he never looked and tried to, to get people to give and stuff like that. He started to pray. God provided, and people started giving him money. People started providing. People started helping by the end of his life, that orphanage had grown to 2,000 children at any one time. So he fed, clothed, educated, housed 2,000 children at any one time. But he learned, and this is a testimony as he was going through this journey. The children are dressed and ready for school, but there is no food for them to eat. The house mother of the orphanage informed George Mueller. George asked her, to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. He thanked God for the food and waited. George knew God would provide food for the children, as he always did. Within minutes, a baker knocked at the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning, so I got up and baked three batches for you, and I will bring them in. 
Soon, there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the wheels were fi- wheel was fixed. He asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled, and as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk, it was just enough for the 300 thirsty children. That's when his orphanage was only 300. It took years of George experiencing lack and God's provision until his faith became, became unshakable even in the face of the impossible. It wasn't like George one morning said, okay, I'm trusting God, now everything's going to be easy. It was years of finding lack where things would be, he'd be lacking, but then he'd seek God and then he'd see God provide. And time after time as that happened, his faith and confidence in God grew to the point where when there was a lack, he says, I know this orphanage work is not for me. God has called me to do this, so God will provide. He didn't wring his hands saying, oh, what's going to happen? He looked to God and God, you're faithful. And that's creative faith. But it takes experiencing lack so you can see God's provisions. As young believers, often we will experience quick and spectacular answers to our prayers. As we grow in a relationship with God, he is asking us to believe and continue to seek him and pray even when there are sometimes long intervals between making our requests known and the subsequent answers to our prayers. Do you realize that? When you're first a believer, at least my experience, you pray and, and you just, God would answer. I like what my brother said sometimes. If you're ever sick, go to a new believer and say, pray for me. <laughs> it's like when, when we're new in our faith, it's like we just see God answering so much and go, what? But as we start to grow, all of a sudden, as we're praying, we don't see those immediate responses to our prayers. And you go, what's wrong? Nothing is wrong. He is now teaching you to have creative faith, which means you have a lack, you're going to pray, and you're going to continue to trust God until God has his timing to provide. That's creative faith. Sometimes God allows or even engineers circumstances in our lives that may seem, that may puzzle us as to why these things are happening. You ever had that? You go, why? What is happening here? Why is this happening to me? However, I have learned I don't always know what is best for me or what I really need, but God does. Ecclesiastes 6.12, for who knows what is good for man in his life? Sometimes we may face a difficult or painful situation and we may think to ourselves, I don't need this right now. Ever had that? I don't need this right now. But in reality, God is saying, this is exactly what you need right now. Because I want everything to be easy. I don't want, I want to be everything to go well. And I go, why would you allow this? I'd be so much happier if these people didn't exist, at least in my country. Or this situation didn't arrive But God is saying, this is exactly what you need. Our criteria are based on whatever will make us happy, comfortable, and content. But God's criteria are what will help us to grow in our faith and produce eternal fruit for his glory. God is not so interested in my comfort as in my character. God is not so much interested in my comfort as in my character. It is during our times of lack or need that we turn to God for him to intervene. And when he does, God's glory is manifest. As we exercise creative faith, when we pray for whatever the need is, whether it's healing, financial provision, or a miracle, When the answers come, they reveal the glory of his name. So creative faith reveals the glory of his name. There is never a testimony without a test. You know, when I share the wonderful things God has done, you know, people think, wow. And I, but I have to think back and say, but what was the struggle? that I had to go through a faith until finally I saw that outcome. So it's important when we share a testimony to be real. 
You know, if I shared, if I, if I wrote a little book about all the different people who were healed over the years in our church and all the things God has done, and I put it all together, somebody read that book and says, wow, I can't wait to go to that church. As soon as I walk in the door, I'm going to be healed five times. And, but what I've done is I, I've, I've shared stories that span over 20 years. But there's those times of suffering, those times of lack, those times that we have to seek God even though he seems to be silent even though he's working in the background. Gives a balanced view. When God delivered Israel out of Egypt through the hand of Moses by performing signs and wonders and miracles, God's name was glorified. Romans 9, 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. He says, so through, the, through creative faith, through miracles, signs and wonders and deliverances, God's name was glorified. The glory of his name. Everybody goes, what a God that would deliver Israel from such a powerful, oppressive nation. In Luke chapter 18, a rich ruler approached Jesus with a question that was burning in his heart. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus pointed to the law and the commandments of Moses. The man responded by saying, all these things I've kept from my youth. The next words that Jesus spoke to him shook him to the core and grieved him. You still lack one thing. Sell all you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard this, he was very sorrowful for he was very rich. One thing this rich man lacked was lack. For him to become rich in the things of God, he needed to learn to be totally dependent upon Jesus Christ and not his riches. The problem wasn't that he possessed riches. It was that riches possessed him. His wealth was his source of security and identity. Jesus wanted to fill both those positions in this man's life. You know, this man didn't recognize what he gave up. Do you know what he gave up? There was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, walking on the earth. And Jesus said to him, I'm calling you to be one of my disciples. That man could have said, I'll give this up, and you'll walk with me. You'll be hearing my literal words. You will literally see the miracles. You will literally know me in a very personal way. And he walked away from that, not recognizing what he was offered. But the same way that God is inviting us. He's inviting us. When we go through these times of lack, We go through times of difficulty. He's saying, will you worry or will you trust me? Because if you trust me, I will take you to a place of intimacy that few of my children have. I will teach you something about my heart that few of my children know. Because many do not want or are willing to trust me in lack. But they want to find their supply from another source. But he's saying, I'm offering you a level of intimacy. A level of trust. That is so wonderful. But it's through your time of lack that you'll know my provision and my faithfulness. To operate in creative faith, we must come to a place of totally trusting God and being totally dependent on him for all our provision. While creative faith releases the glory of his name as we testify of God's faithfulness, the error that causes us to falter in creative faith is error of vision. Creative faith operates when our eyes are fixed on God to provide all our needs. Psalm 123, 2. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of the maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Totally dependent on God's provision. That's creative faith. That's creative faith. Saying, God, I have these needs, I have this lack, but I'm looking to you. 
Error of vision is when we look to something or someone other than God for our provision and needs to be met. Worry causes us to turn our eyes away from Jesus and to focus on our problems and look to other people or other things to be our supply. Worry causes our problems or needs to become our idols. Do you know something? If you have worry in your life, you're an idolater. You know why? Because your focus and your attention is on your problems. And you know what you do when you worry? We bow down to our problems, don't we? We bow down to our problems. So we're worshiping our problems. Oh, this is so terrible. Oh, this is so terrible. And so our focus and our, our worship is to our problems. Worry distracts us from seeing Jesus and his faithfulness. Instead, we focus on our apparent lack or possible future lack. Our focus is on our needs and on the uncertainties of life and not on Jesus as a provider. Our vision needs to be upon Jesus and not our lack. That's why error of vision stops us from being able to focus on Jesus and operate in creative faith. An atmosphere of anticipation releases creative faith. This is really important. In other words, we need to have anticipation that God is going to answer. God is going to come through. We won't don't know exactly when or how, but God, you're going to come through. And I found that. And if I look back at all those testimonies of things that God has done, where it looked like there was no way there was going to be a breakthrough. There was no possible way that anything could break through in this situation. And then finally, ah, oh, God, you're faithful. So anticipation releases creative faith. Cares or worries hinder creative faith from operating in our hearts. Looking intently upon Jesus gives us a peace, confidence, and joy that we can fully trust him. So every time we are facing a new challenge, a new lack, maybe a new disappointment, we have an opportunity in the midst of those disappointments, in the midst of those lacks, in the midst of those difficulties to say, God, I'm not going to focus on the problems. I'm going to focus on you and look to you. And day by day, our confidence in God grows and our ability to operate in creative faith continues to grow. This is not saying that everything will be easy. It's saying that God will prove himself faithful. We're going to pray now. Father, thank you for your goodness, Lord. I'm so thankful for Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that no matter how many times I struggle, no many times that I have taken my focus off you, you're there faithful to draw me back to you, to draw my attention back to you, Lord. You're so wonderful, Father. And I thank you that faith is a growing process, like that mustard seed, Father. And Lord, my desire for myself and for every brother and sister in Christ here, Lord, that we would continue this journey day by day, step by step, not looking at the lacks, not looking at the disappointments, but looking to you, our provider, looking to you, Father, who is the creator and who creates those new opportunities, who creates those solutions, who provides for our needs, Father. Yes, Lord, teach us, Father, to be people that are, not, are deep in our relationship with you, who get to know you in such an intimate way that few do, that we would be those who would get to know your heart, to get to know your faithfulness, and we would not be shaken no matter what we would face, no matter what disappointments would confront us. Oh, God, that we would become like that mustard seed that would grow up into a great tree and people would come in the shadow of our faith to find Jesus.